Everything is bigger in Texas. That includes this week. Right state for a playoff interloper, but perhaps we had the wrong team. BYU's chance is here. And the great Gene Wojciechowski is with us. No one is a bigger help to me on College Game Day week in and week out. This is the College Game Day podcast for Wednesday, September 14th. Reese Davis and Pete Thamel here, and Gene Wojciechowski is already joining us. Pete, you and I were talking before we started this podcast, and sometimes the best judge of the show are people who are fans but have a broader perspective. Both of our wives had the exact same reaction to Gene's piece last weekend, which detailed the coaches who had been fired and had gone into the, as Gene so aptly put it, into the Nick Saban Witness Protection Program and came out on the other side better for it. I felt as if we we do a number of pieces like this uh, year to year. I think it's the best one we've ever done. And the reason... Mm. The reason I think that is because it's real easy to go in there and go, oh, Nick Saban touches all these coaches and they go get jobs or to be snarky about it and say everybody just hires Nick Saban coaches. And we got to a different level. My wife since that, it seems that yours did too, Pete. Yeah, no, uh, my wife, Kate. And again, in my house, there's a lot of hirings and firings, right? In a probably cold and bloodless transactional level, meaning like uh, the last thing she said to me before she said that, she was like, oh, it's Sunday. Coaches get fired on Sunday when Scott Frost <laughs> came up. And so she sees that as a it's an inconvenience to our family time. Um, it is true, though. Coaches do get fired a lot on Sundays. Um, so anyway, we, we were talking about the show a little bit, and she said that one, that like really – it really like touched me. Like those guys really like were bearing their souls about what it was like. And they didn't want to like bring their kids to practice or go to the grocery store. And it, and again, she has no idea who these coaches are. I want to be clear. So I think that was indicative of how it, how it cut through the, the story cut through at a, at a human, uh, at a human level. So you got some kudos in Southie, uh, Gene, and uh, I'd be curious how, uh, you know, just how much time you put into it. Was it hard to convince these guys to to, to bear their soul? Yeah, well, two quick things. Uh, one, my wife doesn't even, like, I'll get home and she says, oh, are you gone this week? <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea. Uh, and I need Reese to do my uh, annual performance review uh, moving forward. Uh, that would really be helpful. Uh, that is a story that we actually started working on. Uh, Barry Abrams was a producer on it, and uh, he actually pitched the story um, late spring, early summer, and uh, started working on that thing in July, starting going to each of those uh, campuses and, uh, you know, Arkansas, Arkansas State and Old Miss and Bama, and uh, we got O'Brien also while we were at Bama, and um, going out to Texas to see uh, Sarkeesian, going to Maryland to see uh, Michael Loxley. So we had the benefit of time during the summer. Usually during the season, uh, it just doesn't work that way. It would have been nearly impossible to get all those guys into that story, given the, the amount of time that we have that's compressed into our, our usual game day week. So that was a bonus. Um, relative to what you're, you guys were mentioning about sort of the human aspect of it, that's what struck me also. Um, and that's what helped make the story, I think, different. Uh, that these, these guys, you see them behind a podium and there's this sort of cone of um, invincibility uh, when they're talking to the media or talking to fans or they're just in a, in a different place once the season starts. Here, we got them during the off season. And, and you could tell that just below the surface, and these are highly successful, highly paid uh, people. But below the surface was a real human feeling of failure and a certain amount of embarrassment and shame, probably too strong of a word. But uh, as Butch Jones said in the piece, it's, it's the lowest moment I've ever felt in my life for me and my family. So clearly, even years in some cases after they've been fired, it still hurt. And, and just like it would hurt us. And it didn't, it didn't matter how much money you got paid the previous year, Butch Jones, $4 million. It still hurt for someone to tap you on the shoulder and say, you're not good enough. Get out of here. And, and I think we forget that sometimes. Fans forget it sometimes. That these are human beings. And it hurts 
when someone tells you, you're not good enough. We need you to leave. Please clear out your office and get out. A lot of times when people experience that, most times I would say, I mean, people want to move on from their failures. Why do you think they wanted to talk to you about it? I don't know how to answer that one, Reese. Um, I I would like to think in, in most of these cases with these coaches, I've dealt with them in the past. So I, I hope that there's a certain amount of trust there that, that they knew I wasn't there to embarrass them or to mock them or to, I don't know, uh, somehow treat um, their journey and that firing and that, and that low, lowest professional moment in a way that would be anything but respectful. So I, I, I hope that was part of it. And, but I also think that it was a way to get to the other point, which was I was at my lowest moment. And then here was this guy, arguably, not arguably, the greatest college football coach of all time, and perhaps arguably the greatest, uh, I'm sorry, college football coach of all time, and maybe the greatest football coach of all time. And he was there, and he was going to extend a hand to me, and that meant something to me. So I'm going to take you from the lowest to, in a sense, the highest point. And the only way I can get there is to describe to you how bad it was when I got when I got canned, when I got the pink slip, when someone kneecapped me. And on the other end of it was this guy, Nick Saban, to, to try to help me out. So I maybe that had something to do with it. And maybe like all of us, Reese, um, they just needed to vent. They wanted to, they wanted to explain how it really, really felt. Can I ask a little inside baseball question here, Gene? I think one of the things uh, Reese and I've tried to do on the pod is give people a little peek behind the curtain at game day. And I've been uh, a game day uh, employee for about 12 minutes now. And uh, one of the things that I've learned is uh, how talented the producers are who, who work on those, uh, who work on those features. And that was probably what a five minute feature uh, Gene ish. Yeah. Four, four minutes or five. Four okay. Four or five minutes. Yeah. Give, give people a sense. And I really had no idea um, in, until I recently did a feature with Michael Connor on uh, Marcus Freeman, how much, time how many trips how many hours of film get condensed into those four minutes and then what the the real magic is which is hard to quantify is how the 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 producer ninjas mix it all together to really make it uh to, to really make it a digestible uh you know forward moving quick uh compelling narrative uh well i'm glad you asked that about the producers because uh, we have some fantastic ones, and they deserve um, they deserve more than a few pats on the back. But uh, in again, this was a little unusual because we had the benef benefit of time and summer and, and extra traveling. But in this case, I think uh, Barry Abrams traveled to two of the uh, campuses uh, with me. I went to the other ones. Each interview might last, I don't know, 20 minutes, half hour. It, it just depends. Maybe... Lane Kiffin was 40 minutes. Like Loxley was 45. Uh, Nick Saban was 15 or 20. Um, Bill O'Brien, um, because of Alabama's policies regarding assistant coaches, he wasn't able to come into the room and sit with us. That's just Saban's rule during the season. So we actually had to shoot that during um, O'Brien's uh, annual meet the press moment. So there was an entire room full of, uh, of local press there. So, you know, Barry came up with a way to try to shoot that where it looked like it was more of a one-on-one -on -one interview. So those are the sort of things that, that a producer has to deal with. The producer will arrange our crews. Um, he will work with the, uh, the media relations people at the schools, try to get us the right room, the right setting. Um, so there's a, a lot of little things that go into it. And then uh, once the interviews are shot, and once I write the script, I send it in to them, uh, to Barry, and um, he'll take a look at it. Then we have a, a, another sort of uh, producer that oversees um, uh, the field producers. His name is Ben Weber. And they'll go through the script and say, we want you to change this. This is fine, great. Then you track the piece, which is uh, basically narrating your, your script in parts. And then off they go back in Bristol and in the editing room. And a lot of the magic, as you said, and a lot of the feel 
happens in that editing room. Barry will work with an editor and uh, they'll sort of, they'll just know when they're looking at it, what works and what doesn't work. And then we'll have uh, various drafts of Vimeos, we call them, of, uh, of that piece. And we'll go through it, I don't know, uh, sometimes 10 times, five times. It just depends on where we are as far as the, the health of the piece. So it is definitely a collaborative process. And um, it, it's, it's pretty interesting to see how the, the sausage is made. And, and in this case, uh, uh, Barry and Ben and the editor uh, did a wonderful job sort of putting that all together and bringing that script to life. And occasionally they'll let me weigh in and sometimes they'll listen, sometimes they won't. Again, they have the best vantage point from that edit room. So um, it, it's cool to see it all come together and, and turn into a piece that you'll see on Saturday morning. The editing was phenomenal, particularly off the top of the piece and even little shots like when Loxley was talking about having to take the kids to the swimming pool that front when he was running Alabama's football camp. Um, everything. Well, let, me, let me add one thing, Reese. I mean, one of the things, you know, again, we probably did, I don't know, uh, five hours of, of shooting and four minutes makes it. And out of that, probably three minutes is actual sound from the coaches. So think about that for a moment. Uh, but one of the things that we weren't able to put into the piece was at the time, Loxley had basically crashed at Lane Kiffin's apartment at this building. And you know the, the layout of Bama much better than I do, having gone there. But he mentioned an apartment building that overlooks the football facility. I don't know where that is exactly. You you probably would. Anyway, it was a, whatever floor it was, the 10th floor of this apartment building or 7th floor. And Loxley was just, was basically uh, grabbed a couch and was just going to stay with Kiffin so he could save some money. And he, he calls Kiffin as he's walking the kids over to the pool. And he's like, Lane, this is the absolute rock bottom for me. And Kiffin goes, yeah, I know. I'm watching you. I'm, I'm watching you from the apartment. And he's laughing at Loxley and, and you know, He's taking video of Loxley uh, walking the kids over. And we begged Lane, can you please find that video so we could use it in the story? And he looked. He really yeah. tried to find it. I'm he sure he did. But uh, <laughs> those guys know. I mean, Lane and Loxley had been in the same position. And really, Lane had something to do with more than a few of those coaches ending there. I mean, he yeah. talked to Loxley about it. Uh, he talked to uh, Sarkeesian about coming to Bama. So there really is this um, Kevin Bacon, you know, six degrees thing at Bama. But at the end of the day, it, it really is cool that Saban, and he had the equity, as you mentioned on the show, to pull this off. And that other coaches, and I think Pete has mentioned this, other coaches are beginning, head coaches are beginning to look at that sort of talent pool of fired head coaches to bring them into their program. Well, look, I mean, it was evident Saturday because Gary Patterson, uh, I don't want to. I don't want to take away from Quickkowski, but I, I would find it stunning if he didn't have a heavy hand in the evaluation and preparation of the game plan uh, on Saturday. I want to ask one more question about your piece, though, Gene. And that was one thing. It's funny I said that I do a show review every week, and one of the things I put in the show review is when we have someone on. You don't have to say I want to ask a question; just ask the question. So I'm going to do that now. Um, <laughs> How did you find that the coaches who had gone in and had to do some tasks that really below their level of expertise and sat in the outfield as right. opposed to the infield and the perhaps while some gratitude in the moment, but maybe a little irritation, not resentment, but irritation uh, with Saban and the demanding ways that it goes. How did you find that that, changed once they moved back into the big seat well you have to understand and this won't surprise either one of you because you you've dealt with nick saban uh, there's no um uh there's no confusion about what your role is when you get there uh, that's part of the deal and when each of those guys let's say butch jones who had competed against saban at tennessee and the sec at the highest level and, uh, you know, ran his program. And, and this was a, you know, upper, uh, upper echelon program. Uh, 
Um, and now he's he's banished. I mean, he's an analyst. He's he's not even an assistant coach. He's making what what do you say, thirty thousand, thirty five thousand yeah. a year. But when he comes in there, and and it happened with each of these guys, Saban tells him what you're going to do, and here's what I expect from you. And if you can't deal with this, then you don't need to be here. So unless you know going in, you're going to be in the outfield and you're not going to say a word unless I ask you to say something. And one of the things that Kiffin said, and again, he was hired as an offensive coordinator and was in the infield. He said like at one of the early meetings, Saban said something and Kiffin started chiming in and everybody looked at him like they wanted to put a knitting needle into his eye um, was that um, it was rhetorical. Saban doesn't want you to speak unless he asks you to speak. And it's even tenfold that when you're in the outfield. And as Sarkeesian said in the, in the piece, it's like sitting at the kid's table on Thanksgiving dinner. You know, you are out of sight and, and you just have to deal with it. So then when you move to the infield, I think you have a greater appreciation for the outfield people, first of all. And secondly, you, there's a sense of accomplishment. You have worked your way to the outer ring, from the outer ring to the inner circle. And so, but again, they know going in, this is what's expected of you. If you can't deal with it, you probably shouldn't say yes to this job. I think what I was wondering, though, was more so when they got their own jobs again. Because I, I know from a few of the guys, some that were in the piece and some that weren't, they, I mean, it was really irritating. Why is he like this? Why does he make us do this? Why does he make us do that? And then when they get get back into the chair, I've heard a couple of them say, I go, oh, I get it. I, I understand that. Even though they've been head coaches before. Did you find, did you find any of that? Uh, absolutely. Um, I, I mean, look, Lane Kiffin won't make any secret of it. I don't think I'm divulging any uh, state <laughs> secrets here with him, but you know, he certainly chafed under the thumb of, of Saban, even as a member of the infield and as an assistant coach there. He didn't understand it in a way. Um, but once he got out, and I think he's applied some of those things that he, he witnessed and learned uh, un, under Nick at his own programs now. Um, you know, Steve Sarkeesian said he went there mostly because he wanted to learn how, how Nick Saban did things. And, and Michael Loxley had other opportunities to go work for other programs as full-time assistants. Um, he was even kicking the tires on NFL teams, and they were kicking them on him also. But he went to a place where he wanted to learn and be uncomfortable. And you definitely are uncomfortable with Nick Saban at times. So I think that's the trade-off, yes. It's, it's irritating. It's annoying. You don't understand it. Well, I, hey, I was a head coach. Why are you talking to me like this? But once you get out, it's like being a kid and, and you don't understand your parents. But as you get old and you're raising your own kids, all of a sudden, ah, I, now it makes sense. My kids don't actually uh, believe in any of that, but I, I like <laughs> to believe that it, it makes a difference. I'd be curious from from Reese and and from Gene. We you know we've all done this a long time. We've dealt with a lot of fired coaches, right? And Reese, you've quite frankly worked with a lot of fired coaches. Mm -hmm. um, you know, football, <laughs> basketball, on broadcast. That's usually uh, usually you don't walk off the championship stage and go into the you know go into the color booth. So, um, I think the psyche of the fired coach is fascinating because they it's almost like someone who's gone through a bad divorce. Like they, it, it, it's hard years later, years, years later. It's hard to, it's, it's hard to shake it. And I'd be curious, Reese, from all the different guys you've worked with, like did Bobby Knight still complain about Indiana, you know, like 10 years later or, or however long it was then I, I'd just be curious to, a little bit of that, of, of that perspective, because that those firings, when they're public and you're in the spotlight, I, I felt like over the years with the coaches I've dealt with, they just, they don't go away. Mm -hmm. You're right. All of them that I've dealt with, that sting doesn't go away. Bob was a little bit different because I, I think, you know, he believed that it was uh, unjustified you know, what mm -hmm. had happened in there. And it's been well documented that until recently, he didn't have any intentions of, fairly recently intentions of going back to Indiana because of the hard feelings. I'm glad that 
that has has been resolved apparently um, you know given especially some of the things that Bob's going through right now but I think for the most part it it is because it, it's one of the things that we all meet as a challenge in life no matter how important you think your job is whether it's the host of college game day or the head coach at Alabama or the head coach at Maryland or wherever it is. That's not your life. You think it is, but your life is how your family greets you when you come home every night. I heard a wise man say that one time. And I think that there's a, a bit of a reality shock for the guys who've been fired and come into broadcasting. They, they realize that, that, when everything was at their fingertips and they were running everything and everybody was, yes, coach, yes, coach, what can I get for you, coach? And all of a sudden now you have to get your own coffee or you have to, you know, uh, pick up your own dry cleaning or whatever it is. I think there's a little bit of a shake back into reality, but there is also among those guys, um, I won't say universally, but near universally, a bit of an addiction to the game. The one thing I'll say out of all of the guys, and I don't really, I don't really view Bob in the same way because he went to Texas Tech and then left, left of his own volition and came to us, which we were grateful for. Um, but I think the other guys, there's almost an addiction to stay close to it, to to talk to other coaches, to be involved and in, and in, and to know what's going on. And, you know, I, I would imagine that would be the same in broadcasting, too. That's at least that's my experience with them. I don't I, I haven't found in working with them that they spend a lot of time uh, complaining. There may be the occasional uh, slipped in joke, you know, about, you know, about getting fired, a pink slip or that guy fired me or whatever, but not, um, you know, sort of the self-deprecating kind of joke. But there's not a lot of you know, moaning about, I got fired, this guy, I can't believe he did that. Uh, I That hasn't been my experience. And generally, when I work with these guys, uh, I spend a lot of time with them. You know, it's riding to the airport, eating dinner, um, you know, in studio with some of the guys who've been in studio, you spend hours, you know, day after day with them. So I haven't found a lot of them to be sitting around complaining, but you do get that sense of that Gene talked about it. I don't know if it, 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 it's, Gene's right, it's not shame. Uh, it's a little embarrassment, as we all would have if we had something that didn't go the didn't go the way we'd hoped in a very public way. Gene, one quick one here. I know you don't like to give away what you're doing on College Game Day, but you've got a fascinating story coming up that'll air this weekend in Boone. You never do this in the meeting. Gene, you asked Gene about the story in the meeting, and he will like give you the most bare bones. So without without giving away the great moments. Uh, tell us, tell us a little bit about the story we're going to see Saturday on College Game Day. Well, just so your people know why I I do that, uh, our our producer Jim Gaiero, I do it partly just to exasperate him, but, <laughs> but mostly I do it because when you guys watch the feature, um, if there's time after the feature airs, I want you I want you to be able to react in the moment. And I don't want you to know what's going to happen in the future. I don't want you to know the details of the feature. I want you to be able to re react organically and honestly and, and, and true to the moment and if you're so moved. And, and if you're not, then you dismiss it and, and you, you move on to the you know, Akron, Tennessee game. It, uh, but, but so partly I do that because I, I want you guys to, to see the piece in real time and be able to react in real time. So that's mostly why I try to keep the details to the minimum. And of course, just, <clears throat> just to get Jimmy G. But uh, <laughs> this week, uh, yes, we're doing a piece on uh, Eric All Jr. Uh, he's a tight end at, um, at Michigan. He's a, a, one of the team captains. And the truth is he wouldn't be at Michigan, wouldn't be a team captain, wouldn't ever play football had something not happened to him when he was five months old uh, in a little town of Richmond, Indiana, on the second floor of a, uh, of a, of a burning house. And uh, so we are going to tell the story of, um, of a kid whose life that almost wasn't, and uh, of a kid who's made the most out of that life. 
and uh, who was granted a, a second chance, uh, sort of, uh, you know, Jimmy Stewart, It's a Wonderful Life sort of theme in a way. And, and the man uh, who helped make that possible. And then a, a meeting between uh, this team captain at, at the University of Michigan and, and the guy uh, years later uh, who was mostly responsible uh, for seeing that, that Eric Hall Jr. had this life. So it was uh, a, a really cool process to uh, delve into the story and to ultimately uh, put them together in a moment that I hope will resonate with people when, when they see the story on Saturday. It always does, my friend. Gene, thanks for being with us. We appreciate can your time. I, can I get one more question with Gene? Yeah, uh, okay. While we, while we have him here very quickly, I don't think I'm giving away state secrets that week four, Gene's beloved Tennessee Volunteers are hosting a high-profile home game against number 18, Florida. Uh, yeah. Certainly the decisions of where college game day go are a few uh, a few office levels above my uh, basement cubicle. But I would think I don't think I'm speaking out of turn to say two top 20 teams in a in a pres presumably rabid environment with a starved fan base would be a potential college game day site. Gene, I'm just curious with your uh, long institutional knowledge of Knoxville and Tennessee, how you think the uh, local community there would react and uh would you be excited to, uh, to to roll back? Well, Reese knows this as well as anybody. I, I, we, for some reasons, it, it's still astounding. We have a love-hate relationship with the uh, Tennessee faithful. It goes back years and years ago relative to uh, Peyton Manning and the Heisman and, and some comments that were, I believe, misconstrued by uh, Tennessee fans. I would tell them to get over it. I think most have. Uh, but uh, I think we would be welcomed with open arms. Uh, the times that we have gone back there, it's been fantastic. And uh, it, to me, and I would say this even if I wasn't a graduate of, of uh, University of Tennessee, I think it's one of the great uh, Saturday settings in college football. And if it so happens that we, we go back there, I think we'll have a great time and I think we'll have a, a great show. But I know there's still some other games in play and some other things that could happen. But, uh, you know, of course, I'd love to go back there. I always love going back to Knoxville. So, uh, but yeah, I, I think, I think it would be a great scene, but um, wherever we end up, hey, happy to be there. This political announcement is brought to you by Wojciechowski <laughs> for Vols. Yes. That message is approved by me. Uh, hey, I'll, what, what I'll, was your jersey? What was your jersey number at Tennessee, Gene? Uh, it's the same as, uh, as one of the Stoop kids, number 12. Number there you 12. go. That. That's a good, that's a good uni number. It's a good uni number. Unfortunately, it never saw the field. It was very much a, a sideline bench number. <laughs> where yeah, it but, but, but if you're, but if you're wearing 12 and you're not out there, then people in the stands are going, they should put 12 in the game. I, I mean, if you're, if you're like, four, that ever. if you're like 43 or something, I don't know. That's probably a bad one. That's Darren Sproles. But you know, there, there's some numbers that nobody notices. They notice 12. Yeah, 59 is not a good number. Yeah, especially for a wide receiver. I mean, what yes. you were. Yeah. If you were 59 and a wide receiver, you're not going in. I was way wide, wide, wide of the field. So, <laughs> what anyway, was game day's on. last trip there, Gene? I don't know. When were we, we were there, I don't know, five, six years ago? Yeah, right? Butch, Butch in Florida against Florida. Okay. Um, All right. Maybe 17, maybe 16 okay. or 17 that somewhere. Sounds about right. Yeah, we yeah. did it on the hill, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It was, it cool. was great. It was fun. We had Spurrier and Fulmer as and they were good. doing Fulmer guest especially. pictures. Yeah. Fulmer was surprisingly good. Yes. Uh, surprisingly good. But uh, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll add this yeah. little How nugget. Gators. 19 years I've covered National College Football. I have never seen a game at Tennessee. Wow. And I pretty much traveled weekly for 19 years. Now, now again, there might have been a game I could have gone to and went to another one, whatever it was. But yeah, so I'm I'd be thrilled because that's uh I've been to campus and I've 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 been to Knoxville. It's a great, great town. Um, but yeah, I'd be pretty fired up to uh to see the old the old gators go in and uh yeah, we're we're open to all uh sailgating invitations too. So just but the one thing I would say about seeing a game there, it's great to have a media pass, unless they've changed things, Gene. Because um, those seats are made for really, really skinny jeans. Really, I mean, if yeah, if, if you if you weigh over one thirty eight, 
it's it's tough to it's tough to squeeze into squeeze into your assigned area there. Yeah, Am well, I being you, fair about that, Gene? That's true, isn't it? Oh yeah, you want to have a suite there, or be in the yeah. press box, or yeah. uh, watch a game from a, a boat on the on the river. But um, yeah, they, there's a reason why they they're over a hundred thousand all the time, or used to be, uh, because they squeeze everybody in there. But yeah, Pete, we got to get you there just to see right. game, regardless of game day. Let's roll. All right. Well, thank you, fellas, for having me on today. All right, Gino. Great to talk to you, buddy. Thanks, right, Gene. Great work. All right, Pete. Looking ahead to the games this week, you know, in the preseason, I picked Utah to go to the playoff. And I said on game day Saturday morning, I don't think they're out of it. And I don't. I think there's still still an opportunity there because this season looks as if it might be one that's turned upside down. But I might have had the right state and the wrong team. And with BYU beating Baylor, and with the opportunity now in front of them, still solid, but maybe not as daunting as it appeared in the preseason, meaning that their game at Oregon this week uh, maybe doesn't look quite the same as it did prior to that debacle the Ducks had against Georgia. And then Notre Dame, obviously, with its issues. Arkansas at home will be, will be a handful for sure. But let's look at this week. If, if BYU is going to start saying, boy, could these guys do this? Could they run the table? Here's a here's a big opportunity for them, regardless of what you think uh, of the Ducks at the moment. With you know Bonick Bonix played better last week, but it was against Eastern Washington. Even one of his touchdown passes should have been a pick, probably. But um, you know there here's the opportunity. It's right here after after just a terrific win against Baylor the other night. Yeah, I, if you are going to be a team that's outside the Power Five, and BYU is obviously an independent until they join the Big 12 next year, you not only have to be perfect, but you also have to have a schedule that allows you to have a case. And you have to have a little bit of preseason juice. It's hard to go from completely unranked to assert yourself in the in the conversation. If you think back to some of those Boise teams back when they were in the WAC, uh, you know, they'd start the season ranked unranked or in the 20s, and it is just a tar fight to get to the, you know, it used to be one or two then. So that was really hard. But, you know, even to get to four, BYU sitting there at 12 now. And look, Oregon's ranked 25th. They obviously laid a dinosaur egg. You go into Autzen Stadium and you win. That's a big deal. I don't care, you know, if this isn't a vintage Ducks team and Dan Lanning's fine to see legs and Bo Nix is a little bit erratic, perhaps like that. That is one of the tougher venues to play in all of college football. So I really feel like right now, sitting here, going into the weekend of September 17th, BYU's got a chance. They have an elite quarterback, which is just going to help their case, right? Like Jaron Hall is as good as any quarterback in the country. He's a top five college football quarterback. They have an elite offensive line that's going to have four NFL prospects, I was told by some scouts who've gone through there this year. Uh, Freeland, their left tackle is a potential first round pick. He's massive. He's six, eight, um, you know, up in the, up in the threes, they have two NFL tight ends. They have a lot of skill, some of which didn't play, uh, against, uh, against Baylor, Baylor on uh, yeah. late, late Saturday night. I was pretty tired by the time that game came around Reese. I, I will, I will admit that. Uh, I don't know how you, you kept your, you kept your energy through, uh, through that whole Stanford game because whew, by the time, uh, by the time all 11 o'clock central hit, I was, uh, I was pretty, uh, it'd been a long day in Austin. I sweat out enough, uh, gravy as Pollock likes to say to where I was, uh, I was pretty tired. Uh, but like BYU has the potential to have a handful of marquee wins. And I don't care if Notre Dame's unranked when they play them. Like that's, that's still, that's still an excellent program with good players and, and it's going to be a big time venue. So like the case is here for, for, for BYU. Now they have to go be perfect. That's not, mm -hmm. that's not easy to do. Um, I think the evolution they showed last year, that Baylor stoned them in the run game last year. Baylor ran it down their throats in Waco. And there was obviously significant evolution and adjustment to where Baylor couldn't move the ball. Um, when you, when you looked at Saturday night, uh, I think they averaged around two yards a rush. So there's, there's a lot of traits about this BYU program that I, that I really like. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I was bullish on them. Our podcast listeners would know early in the season. I, I I'm claiming that I'm right. Cause I haven't been right about much in terms of my picks. So um, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to claim I was an early uh, BYU bandwagon adoptee and I'm going to still ride it. 
Uh, I thought they would lose two of these games off the top first half of the season. That's why I wasn't as high on them. Now it looks a little different, and they look better uh, than I thought. I like you. I'm a believer in Jaron Hall. I mean, he's already thrown for 500 yards, three touchdowns, first couple of games. He's a threat to run. Uh, you know, he's he's going to have an opportunity to really make himself known to the pro scouts and the uh, the greater landscape of college football fans as well. Best in game brought to you by Old Dominion Freight Line, helping the world keep promises. Jaron Hall has been terrific, but a quarter, their quarterback situation is clear-cut at BYU. All of a sudden, not as clear-cut as Texas. Texas plays UTSA this week, a really talented team that's played two uh, gut-punching games, one one lost one. Uh, you know, lost to Houston, pulled one out of the fire against Army. But Texas now, without Quinn Ewers for a few weeks, Hudson Carr was hobbling around at the end of the Alabama game. I believe that this week is more important to Texas than last week. Now, I probably wouldn't have said that had the game gone as most thought it would, gone as scripted, and Alabama had won by 20. But because of the way Texas played, particularly the way it played on defense, you've got to follow that up. You have to. And that means winning the games you're supposed to win. And regardless of your quarterback situation and regardless of how good the roadrunners are, and they're very good. I, I talked to a coach who played against them um, already this season last night and just marveling at the skill and athletic, athleticism that they show and the depth of that. Texas has to win that game. They've got to play well. They can't, you know, have a hangover from the disappointment at the end of the Alabama game. And because if you do, then it's just, okay, they got up to play Alabama. Everybody gets up to play Alabama. And so they have to follow it up regardless of their quarterback situation. I, I agree. And uh, I'm certainly not a doctor, but Hudson Card didn't look right at the, uh, at the, at the end of that game. And uh, he said after the game, uh, I was in interviews that, that he has an ankle injury and it's just hard to imagine him humming at a hundred percent. Now, it, it's a great test of, of the Texas program and how it's evolved, how that offensive line has evolved. Can you just line up, play conservative, run B. John Robinson, hit Xavier Worthy with some bubbles, and just beat up an inferior, talented opponent? Can can you do that? Can you, you know, be creative, get Jordan Winnington the ball a little bit, and just move the ball seamlessly, control a game, and win 21 to 10? Like that. That, to me, is a huge, huge issue. Now, look, the Texas defense especially played exponentially better uh, against Alabama th than I would have thought. And I think there was an element of just, like, toughness there. Um, they obviously self-inflicted some wounds, but there wasn't a time where you were like, they're getting manhandled up front. And that was the case a lot with Texas, uh, especially last season. I mean, they, they just didn't dominate anyone i think of keandre coburn running around all 340 pounds of him or whatever at the nose um they they are better deshaun jameson is injured by the way which is just you know when you play utsa with that skill uh he's obviously texas's best corner that's certainly something that you know to to keep an eye on so i think it's a fascinating test it, i mean for every single road runner a vast majority of whom are from texas this is their Super Bowl. This is bigger than any bowl game. This is bigger than any Conference USA title game. This is the game they're going to go tell their grandkids about. Jeff Trailer, longtime, uber successful Texas high school coach, former Texas assistant. Um, I mean, they are going to they are going to throw everything into this. And I, I'd be naive to not project that. I think it's going to be a close game. Yeah, I, I think it'll be close also. And they don't have – UTSA doesn't have a quarterback issue. Uh, Frank Harris, Conference USA Player of the Week again. Already got, I think he's already accounted for seven touchdowns and over 750 yards. And look, they were on the ropes last week um, against Army, and he pulled them He pulled them back. And, you know, before anyone says, oh, it's just Army. I mean, you know, Army's gone oh. into really good Oklahoma teams and given them a fight. I mean, we – Michigan? We touched, we touched on Michigan. Yeah, we touched on Munkin a little bit relative to the Nebraska job last week. So our respect for him is evident. And uh, UTSA is a – same Same goes for Trailer. He's done a phenomenal oh. job there. And Texas has its hands full because one thing that happens when you play Alabama, even though for the great majority of that game, 
Texas was every bit as physical and physically imposing, if not more so than Alabama. But you typically come out of that game Mm -hmm. pretty battered, you know, pretty Mm -hmm. bumped up and bruised. And there's certainly an emotional drain, but there's a bit of a physical drain, too. And this is this is not perfect scheduling to to have the roadrunners rolling in the week after you go through that. So I think there's some difficulty, difficulty there coming up for Texas. Got a got a few Can categories. I sneak in a quick thought yeah. on another not another smaller team. It was in the back of my mind for for BYU. I just want to plant the flag for Air Force a little bit here. They're they're, they're two they're two and zero. Oh. Um, I think they will be favored in a vast majority of their remaining games, if not all of them. They play Friday night against uh, against Wyoming. And I just really think that that they again take COVID year out. I think they won ten and twenty, and then eleven and nineteen. You know they're they're amid a pretty special stretch for for that program, and they absolutely ragdolled Colorado. I, I don't know if Chris Fowler's like shown his face outside his house uh, the way his alma mater <laughs> got beaten up. That was just a that was just an absolute butt kicking that like a we have to evaluate everything about our about our program and so i just think if again it is going to be hard air force is still unranked right it is going to be very hard for air force to uh to to really come and 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 take on the scene but let's not be surprised if in mid-october they're not sitting there seven and oh going to play boise and they're not in in the conversation uh as usual with air force they are led by a fullback Brad Roberts, mm-hmm. uh, who's averaging a cool nine yards a carry. He's fifth in the nation in rushing, and he is every bit of like that tough, what, what you'd want from an Air Force fullback, right? Tough minded and such. So, anyway, thus ends my Air Force TED talk, but I, I don't, I think they've slid under the radar a little bit. And uh, I, I'm excited to get, you know, really get a chance to watch them on, uh, on Friday night play the, uh, play the Pokes. Yeah, Roberts has been effective. He was a thousand yard rusher last year. Uh, even even last year, they were the only team uh, in the top ten in rushing offense and rushing defense. I, that's a great call. If this is one of those two thousand seven esque years where things get turned upside down, maybe it's the BYU's and the Air Forces rather than the um, you know the near the near misses are the ones just lurking on the edge of the outside, like Cincinnati was last year, meaning outside the Power Five. Cincinnati, or I thought Houston might be that team, haven't been blown away by what I've seen from Houston, and uh, that brings me to another game in the category with uh, UTSA and Texas of games that might be trickier than they look initially on paper. Kansas and Houston. That I mean, Houston already dropped one that they're lucky they're not 0-2 frankly after you know pulling one out against UTSA and now Kansas coming off a, a win at West Virginia too I, I Lance Leipold's a really really good coach a guy good quarterback um the the Jayhawks could could make another little statement right here if they could if they could knock off Houston yeah I mean the the bursts of Kansas football optimism post Mark Mangino could be fit on a fortune cookie, right? Like, I mean, there just has not been a lot to like, it has been as bad of a spiral. Uh, they, they like doubled down terrible football hires with terrible athletic director hires. And then they kept getting worse somehow. So right now with Lance Leipold and Travis Goff in charge there, there's a prioritization of football. I thought it was important. Reese, they extended Lance Leipold by a year, right, right before the season started, they were saying, Hey, we believe in this guy. We went and won in Austin last year. You know, they were, I believe, two and 10 last year, but there was just a sense of this is progress. This is happening. If you looked at their, you know, their average margin uh, in league games, to, you know, two years ago compared to last year, there was a significant, I want to say like a two touchdown difference in, in that. So Lance Leipold has him, has him rolling. Jalen Daniels is a very good quarterback. I mean, they, Morgantown's a hard place to win for Big 12 schools. A lot of dreams have gone and died in Morgantown over the years. And the fact that they went in there, they were down two touchdowns, stormed back, held on in overtime. It was just as impressive of a run, uh, as impressive of a win as uh, as you've seen. So here, here you are for Kansas. They've already matched their win totals for last year. 
And I just think if you look at the overall uh, talent upgrade at, at Kansas, I saw a bunch of their coaches at some satellite camps this spring. And, you know, you, you start asking them just your basic questions of, hey, where are you better? And it, the answers were just, we have upgraded. 45% of the roster has flipped since Leipold got there. And there's just a feeling that they have upgraded, uh, you know, just significantly across the board, especially athleticism wise, especially defense. And we, we're just going to put it on the game day list. Just put it on the long list. If they win in Houston on Saturday, the, the mighty Duke Blue Devils, they have an FCS team this weekend. We could have the clash of 3-0 and traditional bottom feeders. All right. Uh, Duke goes to Lawrence and uh, Mike Krzyzewski, Bill Self, uh, John Shire will not be involved. And it could be a, you know, a game of significance. The winner of that game could get ranked. So, um, you know, good on Kansas and good on Duke for for making that part of the conversation and not making that game a, a punchline, which it would have been, quite frankly, last year. Well, they play in the Champions Classic. And and that's the other thing. Leipold's done a good job there. And the early returns are that um, that. Mike Elko is a perfect fit, just like a, a well-fitting pair of trousers. You know, do things just sort of things just sort of you know make you make you more confident, make you feel better. And and uh Duke's Duke's much better there. Duke and Kansas would be would be something. I think it would be an experience for some of our football only guys. Um, I've been to Larry Town so many times for basketball. It'd be cool to be there for football, but I don't know that I'd get a wow, this is new. You know, feeling like I'm going to get in Boone this week or something. So, yeah. but I would be excited to go there for football because when I was there for basketball, I'd never met Lance Leipold before. And I was able to visit with him for a while this basketball season. Really sharp guy, really Im impressive dude. I want to tell a funny story. Please uh, do. Please so do. Lance, that, that's Lance what Leipold. this is about. I've known Lance Leipold for a bit, and uh, it was the the Monday night of the national title game. He was with a Kansas contingent that flew down for the uh, for the weekend. So uh, we'd been texting just throughout the final four, and I was, you know, you get to these games three four hours early or whatever if you're a reporter. So I went to go see uh, I went to go see Lance Leipold in the stands, and Lance is a son of Wisconsin, modest guy. Uh, you know, sort of just a Midwestern. He's been in, you know, worked in Nebraska for, uh, for, for 12 years. And, you know, he's in with the Kansas VIPs, like you name a Kansas basketball, all American they're there. So we're chatting and uh, I won't, uh, I won't say which Kansas legend it was because I don't want to be mean, but Lance is like, Hey, give me a second, Pete. I want to go get a picture with this guy. So no problem. So Lance goes over, shakes his hand. And this former Kansas all American had no idea who he was. <laughs> I Come mean, on. none. <laughs> you got, you got it. Lance, to his credit, is very deprecating. He gets a picture. I might have taken the picture. I don't remember. He walks back over, looks at me, goes, "Oh, he had no clue that I was against." <laughs> Paul, Paul Pierce. <laughs> it might have been Paul Pierce. Might was have been it? Boston's own Paul Pierce. It was Paul Pierce. Yeah, it, it was. was it really? Yeah, it was Paul Pierce. I, I knew it, was, it. it. It was New Orleans, so you know Paul Pierce might have had some uh, pregame festivities that uh, that you know didn't involve uh, a, a, a museum. <laughs> so. <laughs> I will say this. What are you a saying, few Pete? Later, a few minutes later, uh, Danny Manning was there, and he popped over to do the same thing. Got a picture of Danny Manning, and Danny Manning she says, "Like, coach, you're doing a great job." Like Danny Manning was like locked in and knew it, but it was just sort of me. I was like, "That's a little bit of the portrait of what it's like to be a Kansas football coach." <laughs> da Danny Manning is one of the all-time good guys. When you consider yeah. the level of accomplishment oh. that he's had in his life, yeah. he is one of the kindest nicest most professional people you'll ever meet I, I i i like danny a lot that's not surprising that he knew exactly exactly who it was i want to hit you with uh not to take us to negative town before we go group of games that sound better on paper than they'll actually be well you don't sound on paper you know what i mean you look at the yeah. you only think go boy that sounds like a big game penn state auburn oklahoma nebraska Michigan State, Washington. All those sound like really brands. good games. Brands. Yeah, big brands. And I'm not terribly enthused about any of them. Maybe there's some curiosity surrounding Oklahoma, Nebraska, but that's different from being enthused and thinking I'm going to be, I think this is going to be some great football game. 
Yeah, the, the, we'll start there. The The interim dynamic is always interesting, right? Mm-hmm. Especially as this trend of early firings has uh, has has come upon us. The the fire of Scott Frost is actually later than the earliest firing of last season. Remember, Randy Edsel got run basically Labor Day weekend um, after they uh, after the, after they uh, laid a laid a huge egg in week zero at Fresno last year. Remember the game where UConn's cleats were melting because it was so mm-hmm. hot on the field. Mm-hmm. So, I, you know, we, we we've had like a little bit more experience with interims and what they could do and how they could do it. Uh you know, Mickey Joseph's an impressive guy. I mean, who has brought together and developed better wide receivers in the last uh, handful of years than than when you think of that 19 LSU team and like the real dudes that they had at receiver. I mean, those guys are the best guys in the NFL right now. When you look at Jefferson and Chase, I mean, so uh, he's got a great reputation and he's going to give that program an energy jolt and the new voice that, that Trev Alberts wants. So I'll be curious the, the danger of the interim is you change too much and then everything really spirals. So can he bring a new energy in enough wrinkles to sort of flummox, uh, flummox Oklahoma, as opposed to trying to change too much? I will be very curious to see how they respond. Um, and I think a lot of the $7.5 million decision that Trev Alberts made will be judged on how they respond in this game. He, um, <clears throat> you know, he's been around the ultimate interim coach from his time with Ed Ogeron, who, you know, has oh, yeah. mastered the craft of being the interim coach. I'm sure they're started and ended. there. Yeah. Right. You know, the, um, <laughs> the, the thing is, I thought one of the things that occurred to me as it pertains to Mickey and his playing career at Nebraska, you know, the old, uh, the old stage adage to wish someone well is to tell them to break a leg. That probably isn't what he wants to hear in the Oklahoma week, because if memory serves, I think he suffered a broken leg against Oklahoma in that game back when he was a player too. So there, he's got a little history within the uh, long and storied one in this, in this particular rivalry. Are, are you as uh, bleh about Penn state and Auburn as I am? Well, I'm excited to see Nick Singleton who broke out against Ohio last week. And he has been, I went through Penn state in the spring, watched him in a practice, listened to the coaches, uh, Jay one Sider, the running back coach, James Franklin, your I mean, people were buzzing about this kid and he has lived up to every, every bit of it so far. Um, he was a monster against Ohio last week. So I think I'm most curious to see, can they go in and run the ball down uh, Auburn's throat? It's uh, Phil Troutwine has overhauled that offensive line. It you know no better test than than an SEC opponent. And I and I guess some of my intrigue from the Auburn side is if can they if complete they, a forward pass? Yes, that that. But also if they if they lose, does this start the you know the, their AD search is going on now? Um, there's a lot of people kind of buzzing about that in in AD circles like does this start the sort of what we've all assumed is the inevitable exit of Brian Harson, um, yeah. which, which I, is not some like manufactured media thing. They tried to get rid of him through yeah. that uh, just totally r- ridiculous, baseless uh, witch hunt in, yeah, uh, was- in, in February. So they've, they've brought the program spiral upon themselves. And now it's sort of just like, how do they begin some sort of uh, exit? And if Penn state goes in and wins authoritatively, that, is where this, you know, Auburn season sadly, uh, sadly goes. They completely like uh, Tanya Harding, his, uh, his knees for, yeah. for lack of a better way to put it. So I guess, I guess I'm intrigued by that game for a couple of things. I think Penn state's going to be better. I know Kirk has been very bullish on Penn state, mm-hmm. very, very vocal, uh, very vocal about it as the uh, bandwagoner of the Sean Clifford fan club. Um, I I'm an early Nick Singleton adoptee from seeing him this spring. So let's, Let's go hey, look. That's a hard place to play. Let's go see if they can they can let it rip there and 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 be a you know be in the Big Ten conversation. And I think if you go win there, you're in the playoff conversation. Uh, I agree with you about excitement about Penn State. I think my um, lack of enthusiasm for the game itself is just questioning uh, Auburn's ability in the in the passing game. I mean, T.J. Finley has you know had moments and then he throws the ball to the wrong team. And you know, Robbie Ashford is a guy that I really liked in high school. And never really got it going at Oregon, never really got the chance. And, you know, there are moments at Auburn, maybe, you know, maybe he's the guy. And then the, the whole Zach Calzada thing is a bit of a mystery. I think that's what's going to happen. Uh, Auburn's, Auburn's got some dudes on defense, and it won't mm-hmm. come initially. But I think over the course of the game, Auburn's going to have such a hard time moving the ball that Penn State eventually will be able uh, to move the ball. I think Penn State will 
win. And I'm not talking like an ugly blowout or anything, but I think it'll be a, a decisive road win. It'll be a good win. But the the Harson exit is going to happen one way or the other. If I'm wrong about Auburn and they play better in the passing game and they beat Penn State and they go on a run and have a really good season, then Harson's gone because he'll find another job to take. If it goes the other way, then it's he's gone for the reasons you say. So this is going to happen. The question is when and how. And you know, at least to me, I don't think there's any there's no coming back from what happened in the off season uh, from that long term. If you if there is any reprieve, it's temporary. There's no coming back from this. This is over. The question is when. And I I would I would be stunned if it's not over one way or the other at the end of this year. It may be at the end of a 10 win Auburn season or or at the end of a, a mediocre one, because I think they've got decent talent. They're not going to you know go out and just stink it up in any game that they play. But this is not going to last long term. The powers that be there didn't want it to last. They, they, they pushed out one of the best young athletic directors in the game for some inexplicable reason. And so now they get to do what they want and they'll, they'll start over and, and get different guys. Worth noting Reese in uh, composite recruiting rankings right now, Auburn is 14th of 14 sec schools. And that, well, that is shows not, you. that is not an indictment of Brian Horson. That no. is an indictment of a lack of faith in recruits and high school if you're a high school coach it'd be hard in good faith to send a player to auburn and say hey this is what it's going to look like your next five years and this should be when his recruiting is really hitting its stride and instead they are uh they are well behind vanderbilt michigan state and washington real quickly here too a little uh, uh that is that a better game than i than i think sounds good you know. I'm excited to see. Look, Kalen DeBoer, wherever I, uh, he has gone, yeah. NAIA, Division II, wherever Kalen DeBoer has gone, winning football has followed. And there is, again, in a small sample size, a distinct uptick in how Washington has played since he arrived. So I, I, they're favored in that game, which No, I think they're going to win. I, yeah. I just don't know that it's going to be a wildly entertaining game. That's all. No, That's... it could definitely be a slog. It could yeah. definitely be a slog. Might be a good day to stay on your boat in the lake. Yeah. <laughs> No, no, no. We don't want to keep people away from from that state. We want them to go in and get excited about about the Huskies. Uh, I'm I'm a little bit of a Michigan State skeptic. I think they're ranked a little bit higher. Not that I don't think they're good. I do. But, um, you know, make a believer out of me, Sparty. You know, but 11, yeah. 11 seems high uh, yeah. to me a little bit right now. I think I have them in the 20s someplace. So Hard good. to hit portal roulette two years in a row. So I'm going to I'm going to wait and see that. I'm just not going to assume yeah. that's happened. Right. Exactly. And maybe it has. And and that eventually, eventually, outside of the uh, Ohio State, Alabama, Georgia's of the world, outside of those, the coaches who do that best, at least until there's some other framework that changes it, those will be the teams that rise up from year to year. Agreed? Yes, absolutely. I, I mean, the, yeah. the the big boys aren't going to have to do it, you know, but the yeah. but the other the other ones will. Mm -hmm. And how about the desperation that will be in College Station on Saturday night? And you have Miami coming in with a thousand times better quarterback situation, opportunity to, to really, really send the old Aggies reeling. And Texas A&M, after the Appalachian State loss, desperate to – to get a victory against against Miami, and it's it's based on what you saw. They, they couldn't stay on the field offensively against Appalachian State, and couldn't get off of it on defense. You're kind of hard pressed to see how that's going to happen. But as uh, we talked about old coaches early in there, Lou used to Lou Holtz used to tell me all the time, "It's a different team every week, Coach. You do not get the same football team from one week to the next." <laughs> and good. so that's what the Aggies are banking on is that they don't get the same football team that they had. Uh, a week ago. Do we think the Pollock prophecy comes through this week and the uh, Haynes King era uh, sputters to an end here and we see some Max Johnson or maybe some Connor Wiegman? I, Pollock, I give him credit on the podcast. He watched the film. He was very bullish on, uh, you know, he's been on the Max Johnson bandwagon for a while, but he's very bullish on a quarterback change coming at uh, at, mm -hmm. at AM. and uh, yeah, it, uh, it it would not surprise me if uh, if if we do see you have to do something right now. Mm -hmm. I will say this: uh, it I mean, App had the ball for forty one minutes, right? So yeah. that's that's it, it, it. Credit them for the you know for the for the perfect 
strategy. You know, if you keep the ball away from them, they can't they can't score. So um, yeah, it'll be it'll be very interesting to see how Jimbo responds. Were you surprised he sort of openly pondered giving up play calling? Um, a little bit because of my regard for him as a play caller, and I know that he is very a very confident guy. But I think I alluded to this on the Monday podcast, and I've applied it to Jimbo. The notion that David Shaw was talking to us about last week about institutional knowledge when you're at a place for a long time in David's case, or you know a lot, and then how much of that weighs you down in terms of how you ought to be thinking about your approach. He, he changed by going and incorporating a huge chunk of the Wake Forest slow mesh RPO type stuff. I think that applies to Jimbo in a different way, not in terms of institutional knowledge of Texas A&M, but institutional offense of a Jimbo Fisher offense, a Jimbo Fisher quarterback, uh, and how they want to do things. Jimbo Fisher's forgotten more offense in the last five seconds than I'll ever know. I I still think he's a really good offensive guy, terrific offensive guy, and, and a great developer of quarterbacks. I've always said that, you know you're tough if you played quarterback for Jimbo Fisher. He is rough on those dudes. And I know you've, as I have, you've been to Jimbo Fisher practices. And it makes them better. Mm-hmm. But I get the sense that it's stale and he may, it may be, and this is for him to evaluate and me to opine on, it may be that he's weighed down by the institutional knowledge of what it means to be in a Jimbo Fisher offense. And perhaps there needs to be a, a reevaluation of that. And based on, you know, their up and down performances offensively, they've had moments, but they haven't been consistently great or explosive. Maybe it's time for that. So because of that, um, I guess maybe it didn't surprise me as much. Yeah, I just think holistically there, Reese, the the sum is not greater than the parts right now. And the sum mm-hmm. is not equal to the parts. And that that falls directly on Jimbo Fisher. They have mm-hmm. a lot of talented players, and a lot of them are young players too. You just don't get great recruiting classes and they're they're magically microwaved into all conference players. But you, you you just can't argue pound for pound how much more talented they are than App State. And that 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 requires a difficult autopsy of that uh program right now. For sure. So we've given you what to look forward to when we come back on the podcast on Friday. It will be time to punch ourselves in the face, show you how bad we are at picking games. Although I think we're both close to 500, but overall in the season, I am tragic. But it'll be fun on Friday when we come back and pick some games. Yeah, that that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. I'm due. I, 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 you know, I'm going to save it for Friday. I've got a new philosophy, or not a new philosophy, but I've reminded myself of a philosophy on picking games. So we'll be back with picks on Friday. Be sure to listen uh, three times a week to the College Game Day podcast. Enjoy it wherever you download your podcast. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+.